Now we're going to get into the more of the specifics in this video two, hemostasis video two. Okay, we start first with what we've already said. Step one is vascular spasm. We talked about that. Step two is platelet plug formation. And now we're into coagulation, coagulation. Let me clear up another generic issue here. As we get into the coagulation cascade, I want you to note that calcium is absolutely necessary in all clotting reactions except two reactions. It is acting as a cofactor in the enzymatic reaction. Certain substances, like you'll hear tissue factor, tissue phospholipid, will act as coenzymes. Now, from your ANP1, if an enzyme requires a coenzyme, a cofactor, to work, if it's not there, it won't work at all. It can have all the other constituents present, but if that's not there, it will not, it will not work. Here is a detailed scheme of the coagulation process. I've tried to write it out. You'll see in a moment, but this will kind of give you an idea if you want to study through it. Now, I'm not going to get very heavy on that, but I do, but since, uh, my test probably will be, uh, essay, so you do kind of want to study it, but you can, you can study it as you go along. We have two pathways, as I alluded to earlier, a prothrombin activator to get to something called prothrombin activator, we'll see. We had the procoagulants, which are the clotting factors, and you can read in this particular here. Phase two is the common pathway. The common pathway is phase two, we'll see. So phase one, again, was both the extrinsic pathway and intrinsic, coming from two directions, extrinsic or intrinsic, or both. And then we get to the common pathway, and then we have to make the clot get stronger, which is kind of a third issue, to make the, the clot get more stabilized. It's weak when it comes to out of this pathway. All right. So I start first with what I'm going to call my extrinsic pathway. Now you can refer back to this as you, as you look at what I've written here. In order to activate the extrinsic pathway, a hole must be poked all the way through the blood vessel. That's what the extrinsic means, is that you have this blood vessel and a hole's going all the way through the wall. When that occurs, a chemical called tissue factor leaks in from the tissue fluids outside the blood vessel. That chemical, along with some circulating calcium, which would act as a cofactor in the bloodstream, activate an enzyme in the bloodstream that converts inactive clotting factor 7 to 7. So, this, so what you're trying to do is activate an enzyme in the bloodstream to, to change 7 to active 7. Okay? That's step one in the extrinsic. Once seven is formed, activated seven complexes with circulating calcium and acts as an enzyme to convert an inactive factor 10 to an active factor 10. Active factor 10 complexes with an already active factor 5 along with platelet phospholipids and calcium to form this we'll call prothrombin activator. And the prothrombin activator starts the common pathway. So see, we go back here. This would be the extrinsic. See, we've fallen down that scheme right there. Okay. Then I come to my intrinsic that I wrote. The intrinsic pathway will initiate if the lining endothelial blood cells, see the endothelial cells, you've taken AP1, are lining epithelial cells inside of a blood vessel. Okay. If they are disturbed, that means kicked up. So when you're in a house that has a tile floor, if you if the tiles are totally intact, then everything will be cool. But if one of them kicks up a little bit and you can get underneath, which would be the endothelial, then it'll, that's a damaged inside. See, intrinsic means you didn't have to poke a hole all the way through. You could just ruffle up the inside of the blood vessel. Or... If metal or glass or bacteria touch it. Now, let's talk on that for a moment. When you take blood out of the body, put it in a glass test tube, unless you put some type of substance to keep it from clotting, 
glass will cause blood to clot because glass is a wettable surface. You say, what do you mean a wettable surface? Water will beat up on glass. See, if I had, if I coated something with silicon, water will just whisk off. But water will beat up on glass. So metal it'll beat up on. Now we talked about immune, but I didn't bring this up. That if a foreign body like a bacteria gets in, blood will try to clot around it. That's a beneficial purpose to try to get get rid of it so the white blood cells can catch up with it. So the intrinsic pathway has a lot of things that will kind of kick it off. All right, let's go. The blood vessel wall injury of foreign bodies activate an inactive clotting factor 5. It's in there. To an active one, to an active, uh, to, I'm sorry, clotting factor 12, I said 5. An inactive clotting factor 12 to an active one. Active clotting factor 12 then acts as an enzyme to activate inax inactive clotting factor 11. So 12 turns on 11. These two activations do not require calcium. Factor 11 plus circulating calcium activate an inactive 9 to an active 9. Now remember I told you the clotting factors are not in order because they were in time of discovery. So you may have 1 going to 2, 2 going to 3, 3 going to 4, and then find out, uh oh, there was something in between that you found 10 years later. You can't renumber the clotting factors until so you just have to make the sequence out of order. So we go further. Active Clotting factor 9 complexes with a factor 8, which is already active, plus some calcium to activate 10. Now, 10 is where we ended with in the last, with the extrinsic. As in the extrinsic, one factor 10 is active, it will assist in forming prothrombin activators, st thus starting a common pathway. So we did the extrinsic and the intrinsic. Now, remember... When I showed you way back up here, I said this arrow was longer because there are more steps in the intrinsic pathway than the extrinsic, as you now can see. So we shuttle down, and now we go to the common pathway. The activated factor 10 plus an already active clotting factor 5 plus platelet phospholipid and calcium will form prothrombin activator. Proformin activator acts to convert a clotting factor 2, one of the one of the early ones discovered, prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin then becomes an enzyme, and all it needs is some calcium, and it can convert fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrin is that stringy stuff. Now, you know when you cut yourself, and you see that scab, see that scab, before you get the scab, what it is is stringy, and once the once the sunlight on your skin, uh, the, the, the air dries out the water around that, you see that scab. The scab is dried fibrin, but underneath, because that's, that, that, uh, scab is acting as a cover, a tent, a tarpaulin, to keep it moist underneath, because that fibrin is heavily needed to help repair and get a fibroblast into the area and various substances. Now, so you got a clot. It's not the tightest clot, but you got one. So now we need to tighten and strengthen that clot to pull the edge of the wound together and everything. Once the clot forms, it needs to tighten to give a good plug over the blood vessel damage. Two things help. Platelet contraction. Now, this is what you have to imagine. The platelets have been caught up in that clot. Remember the platelets do a shape change. So when the platelets do a shape change and they got this thready clot substance on them and they start shape changing and spinning, they will act like a spool of thread. They would, as they spin, because they, because the clot is also to the edge of the wound, the clot's to the edge of the wound, the platelets are in there, they're spinning and they're pulling the edge of the wound together as they spin doing their shape change. So that's really important. The other thing is one is the one of the last, or actually the last clotting factor to be discovered. They call clotting factor thirteen, which is called fibrin stabilizing factor. Fibrin stabilizing factor gives a stronger clot. See, initially, fibrin once formed 
hooks to other fibrin. See, the fibrinogen is a big molecule, all made by the liver. What the enzyme thrombin does is cuts off the end. So what it is is, let's say you're making the end sticky. See, as fibrinogen, you don't have sticky ends, let's say. Once you cut part of the molecule off because of thrombin, then you cut the part down to the sticky ends, we'll say. The sticky ends can covalent, covalently bond laterally. But that doesn't give a strong clot. So factor 13 comes in and cuts up into the fibrin to give a cross bonding, covalent cross bonding. And that gives a stronger clot than just this lateral covalent bonding. So that's what that factor 13 is. It stabilizes the clot. It stabilizes the clot. So now we form the clot from the intrinsic, the extrinsic, the common pathway, and now we've essentially tightened the clot down. Again, here's clot retraction and repair that you can look at. Now, the clot retraction, what about the repair? Well, we're now ready to repair. So we have some things called platelet-derived growth factors. Here's something else the platelets do, is to help rebuild the vessel. Rebuild the vessel. Fibroblasts come in, everything. See, that fibrin sets the stage. You've got everything set now. We need to repair that. And then once we repair it, we want to dissolve the clot. So... One thing we don't want is for the clot to get too big and close off everything. So then these here that are some clotting factors that you have. I mean, I'm sorry, ant anticoagulant factors. Anticoagulant factors that kind of inhibit the clot from getting too big. Protein C is a big one. Protein C is a big one. It needs X to com S to complex. And it degrades factor 5 and 8. Now, 5 and 8 are heavily necessary. Remember, 5 you got to have to do the prothrombin activator. So go back and look at these. Then we got an antithrombin factor 3. Now, heparin activates this. So we want to limit the clot, but we also, at the end, want to get rid of the clot. We want to get rid of the clot we'll talk about in a moment because that's only supposed to be a temporary deal. So I'm going to stop right here on this. So this will be hemostasis video two. Hemostasis video two. What have we done in here? We've looked at the extrinsic, the intrinsic, the common, and the strengthening of the clot. Thank you.